Welcome to Eye to Eye. I'm Alistair Laidlaw. I'm a vitreo retinal surgeon in London. I've been asked to talk about vitrectomy in diabetic retinopathy. It's important to recognise that vitrectomy is an important part of the management of patients with proliferative diabetic retinopathy. It's not a sign of failure on behalf of the doctors that have been caring for the patient up to that point. The other thing is we talk about proliferative diabetic retinopathy and that really is a bit of a misnomer. Because actually, if we've talked about proliferative diabetic vitreoretinopathy, we'd recognise the vital importance of the vitreous in the causation of the problems that lead to needing a vitrectomy. So what is going on in proliferative diabetic retinopathy? Firstly, there's a biochemical drive from the retina, which is producing VEGF, amongst other chemicals, other cytokines, and that results in growth of new blood vessels from the front of the retina into the vitreous um, cortex, which is the very back layer of the vitreous. So this is the first time we've mentioned the vitreous in terms of the proliferative retinopathy process. Now, laser and or anti-VEGF drugs, which are extremely exciting, will reduce the amount of growth of those new blood vessels and may even cause complete regression. But actually, the reality is that in a, somewhere between one-third and two-thirds of patients, the vessels will persist. They don't go, and it's not realistic to expect laser or anti-VEGF drugs to cause complete regression of new vessels. And they've got to think about that in terms of your endpoints for PRP or, or um, anti-VEGF injections. After a time, the vitreous reacts to the growth of new blood vessels, and this is called the angiofibrotic switch. And what happens is instead of there being growth of new blood vessels and development of the new vessels themselves and fibrous tissue, the growth stops and the fibrosis takes over and things contract. Now, an important point to get over is that the growth is a biochemically driven process which you can alter with either an anti-VEGF drug or with laser, but the pulling which results in the problems from proliferative diabetic retinopathy is a mechanical process and drugs don't treat mechanical problems. So what are the things that lead to uh, an indication for vitrectomy? Well, firstly, the vitreous separates and pulls on new blood vessels. You might not have been able to see them before because they may have been lying flat on the retina and relatively underperfused, but they get pulled out of the retina. And at the point they get pulled out, you get a vitreous hemorrhage. This is a mechanical complication. And provided the patients had enough PRP to stop them from developing rubiosis, they, the way to judge that is to look at how active the retinopathy is the dilation of the veins, the amount of blot hemorrhages. And in most people who develop a vitreous hemorrhage, the veins are quite thin, there are no blot hemorrhages around. You've got a mechanical problem. At that point, it's either vitrectomy or leave, because more laser or more anti-VEGF injections are not going to do anything beneficial. Those patients, if they have a recurrent hemorrhage, that is one that just keeps on coming back and coming back and coming back, or have a non-clearing hemorrhage, and I'd suggest that a non-clearing hemorrhage is one that's been there for six weeks or more, are eligible and do well from a vitrectomy. And the evidence is that if you've got a non-clearing hemorrhage for more than six weeks, you're highly unlikely to clear on your own and likely to end up with a vitrectomy no matter how long you wait. So six weeks is a good cutoff for that one. The second indication for vitrectomy in diabetic uh, retinopathy is if there's traction, and traction on the macula. Well, here we get into the problems of the definition of the macula and traction. Basically, anything where the fovea is being pulled on um, counts, to my mind, as being macular traction. So that can be a complete nasty tabletop uh, tractional retinal detachment, but it can also be striae running through the fovea, giving the patient impaired and distorted vision. In those circumstances, the aim of the vitrectomy is to remove the, um, the scaffold of fibrovascular tissue, which is crumpling up the retina, crunching it is a great term, and allow the retina to relax out. And that really is um, akin to what we do with an epiretinal membrane. 
Those procedures are made much better if you give an anti-VEGF injection. That cuts down the time of the surgery, the complications of the surgery, the rate of re-bleeding after the surgery. All sorts of parameters have been shown. So one week or a few days perhaps before the surgery, if the retina is going to be um, manipulated, an individual injection, usually of bevacizumab, um, will greatly facilitate the process. The results of um, diabetic vitrectomy have got hugely better. The diabetic retinopathy vitrectomy study came out uh, 30 plus years ago. A lot's changed in that time. And that study had 20% rate of total blindness after vitrectomy. It wasn't something that you wanted to do to a patient, but they still showed that it was better than not doing it. The rates of blindness now, depending on the severity of the retinopathy, that um, the patient's presenting with are around the 1% or 2% level. And those are in patients with really severe traction right at the end of the scale, ischemic retinopathy, who are going to do badly whatever. Diabetic retinopathy is now a very safe procedure with low rates of needing a second operation. No operation is perfect. There's bound to be complications. They need follow-up. But it's no longer a big bad operation for a big bad disease. There's been a lot of evolution. A third indication for um, vitrectomy and diabetic uh, retinopathy is in patients with diabetic macular edema. Now, this is a bit of an unknown zone at the moment. Every study out there suggests that the retina gets thinner, and that, after all, is what we're trying to achieve either with laser or with anti-VEGF injections. But the problem is that most of the studies didn't show an improvement in vision, and it may well be that the reason for that was that the vision had been lost before the vitrectomy had been performed. So there's modern studies going on with the aim of looking at the outcome in treatment-naive patients or in patients who are on anti-VEGF injections to see whether that cuts down the burden. And lastly, the fourth area to consider doing a vitrectomy in, di in proliferative diabetic retinopathy is in patients who present with florid retinopathy. Those who've got not one or two disc areas of new vessels, but those who present with 10, 15, or 20 disc areas of new vessels. And actually, it's pretty likely that if you give them an infritual bevacizumab injection and then perform a vitrectomy, they'll do well. They can have a rock and roll ride with hemorrhage, um, uh, problems, in the vision, uh, problems with their vision after the surgery, but on the whole, they do better than they're going to because of the high risk in those patients of an angiofibrotic switch that causes crunch of the retina. So I hope that summary is useful. Thank you for joining us. For more information on this and related topics, please visit us at uretina.org.